the slides behind me because it was my turn to fix them. Corey and Jared are not here, so I'm just making sure it's following along. Hope you had a great day. Kind of a rainy, gloomy day in North Central Ohio, February 22nd or 23rd in 2023. So it wasn't snow. That's the key thing you have to remember. It was not snow, so we are grateful of that. I'm grateful for some wonderful Bible studies. This is the this will be the third Bible study of the day for me. And uh, I love when God uses someone to help grow another follower of Jesus Christ in coming to know him in a deeper, more meaningful way. And so looking for a great way to cap off a wonderful day with a Bible study tonight. What type of parent are you? I changed that at the last moment because truly what we're going to talk about when you Google these topics, you will find they are mainly or almost exclusively talking about moms. Okay. But I think it can apply because moms are married to dads and dads and moms are supposed to be raising these kids together. So I changed it and we we're going to talk about parents. All right. Though, Parents uh, work together. One is usually a little bit different than the other one. Typically, one is more lenient than the other one, and the other one may be more strict. It doesn't really matter, but we're going to take a look at this. What type of parent are you? In your traditional, if you went to focus on the family, you would obviously pull this up, or you would know to Google this. Are you a tiger, a dolphin, or a jellyfish? That's what we're going to find out tonight, but before we do, we're going to go to the scriptures. We're just going to string together several biblical passages on parenting to make sure we stay biblically focused before we venture off into some secular ways of categorizing different parenting skills or different parenting philosophies, all right? So let's have a word, uh, word of prayer, look at the Word of God, then we'll dig in. Truly want it to be interactive. This evening, that's how it's going to work best. Those of you watching at home or on the podcast, I will try to repeat questions or statements from the congregation so that you can hear as well and follow uh, the conversation through, and it'll make more sense. Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you so much for allowing us to be part of your family. Lord, the privilege and the honor to call you Father, it's overwhelming at times. And then when you turn around, if you choose to bless with a marriage and with and or family, we want to represent you to the ones that you have given us. So Lord, as we look into your word about parenting philosophies, Lord, we know that the only philosophy truly that matters is yours. And so Lord, we pray that we would adhere to what you say, but Lord, grow us as individuals who interact with young people, help us to be more diligent about it, more connected in it, and Lord, do the job you've asked us to do. We pray in Christ's name, amen. All right, so we're going to string together several biblical passages on parenting, ask some questions, give me some answers on what you think is being conveyed here. The first one, so if you were to go Google the top 10 passages on family or parenting, you're going to get a wide variety except for probably a handful up here in almost every list. And we'll get to that list, the one that appears in every list, at the top of every list in a minute. Okay, but this would be one of them. You would find Google uh, biblical passages on parenting. This is one that will come up. So this is talking about leadership in a church. If this leader has children, is married, he has to be one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. What does that look like? If that, you want some help on interpreting that, he must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. So what's that look like? What, what the key word there would be submissive and respectful. Respectful, we, we have a good handle on. We're going to cover that a little bit in a minute. What would be submissive? 
obedience, okay? Obedience from a member of the congregation. Anybody else have any synonyms for submissive? Not selfish, doing something for the other person. Anybody else have any ideas on submissive? Being under the authority of, okay, obeying, being under the authority of, not looking for your own will, someone else's will. Question, can that go too far? Yes. So what would be example of that going too far? Okay. Too abusive or unfair. Okay, so a family can never be too obedient, but the means by which the obedience is obtained can be abused. Am I somewhat close on that one? Yeah. Okay. Just just throwing that out there. We we want to look at these passages and garner some truth. So really we're looking at obedience, listening to mom and dad, and or authority figures. So though this is parenting, every parent worth their weight in salt isn't just teaching their child to obey them. It's teaching their child to obey anybody placed in authority over them. And they have to do it in a respectful manner. Okay, here is what I think. If I were to, someone to say, now give me, we have 15 minutes. You need to teach me about parenting. Parenting and child raising, and I need to teach my children to come up with a passage that covers everything pretty thoroughly in four small, quick verses. I think Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 is it. It covers the parent, and it covers the child. So here it is. Children, obey your parents. Covered that in the last one. It, uh, in the Lord, for this is right. Not only do you have to obey your parents, you have to honor them, okay? Be respectful to them. You can have a child obedient to the commands of a parent and have absolutely no honor or respect for them, okay? That is not, just because they obeyed, isn't, you're not done. That's almost the easy part. The other part is, they have to honor you. And the way they do it is you'll know when you have to teach, you ask them to do something, they need to be obedient or they've not been obedient and you have to address it. They approach you respectfully. Okay? If they're, they're not honoring you. Okay? They're not being respectful of you. They're being disrespectful of you. Because you don't want them to grow up and God do something in their life in response to something they've done and go, God, right? You don't want that. So you don't want to allow them to be disrespectful even though they're obeying you. So children are to, here we see this obey again, and they're to honor them, okay? That it may be wealthy, thou mayest live long on the earth. Fathers, now this is the, Flip side of the same coin, fathers provoke not your children to wrath. Okay? What's that look like? How do you provoke your children to wrath? We're going to look. Don't worry. You can guess, and then we'll see if we hit the top six reasons why in the next slide. But can't. So I want my children obedient, listening to me, loving me, respectful, respecting me. Then God says, now parents, listen, you got a part of this as well. You have a role to play. I have an expectation of you. Don't provoke your children to wrath. Question, how do I do that? Because I don't want to do it. Inconsistent discipline, not only with them, but among the siblings. Johnny did that yesterday, was disciplined. I did it today, nothing. Johnny's going to look at me and say, 
what's up with that? And then the next day, Johnny, did, Johnny got it, Stan did, Stan the next day does the same thing, and then he gets it. Now, now Stan's mad at you, okay? Or Johnny did it, Dad took care of it, Johnny did it, Mom didn't do anything about it the next day, okay? Inconsistency, I would definitely say, is one of the things. What's another way? Unreasonable in your expectations. Okay, we're, you can tell we have brilliant parents in this church because we're nailing them, buddy. We're nailing them, all right? What else? Not keeping promises. Not keeping promises. Learn my lesson. Early on, I can't remember if it was Daniel or Joshua. I know it wasn't Ben, and Abigail wasn't born yet. We talked about keeping promises. And I made a promise to one of them, and it was something that was in the car. I don't know what it was. And it's 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I don't know what we were doing up that late. And one of them looked at me, Dad, you said you would go blah, 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 blah. I'm like, I did, didn't I? So out I went. Because I made a promise. And you can't have, and I think one of the challenges as a parent with promises is that life gets so busy, it's not that you intentionally want to break it, but I'm telling you, you've got to keep them as many as you can. No matter how small. That earns, that gives you some of the respect, okay? Because we know at work, if you're at work and you say, hey, Bill, could you, uh, I got to leave early at three today. Could you do this for me? And he says yes, and you take off and he doesn't do it. You're not happy, are you? But you respect the person who says, hey, Johnny, take off. I got it. Goes ahead and gets it done. You respect people like that. So, that's true uh, about keeping your promises. One more, and then we're going to look to the list so we don't dwell here too long. Not, what, hang, any of you younger people have any ideas? What did anything frustrate you? Just sorry to interrupt. Don't I, ask me that you let me fail. <laughs> <laughs> I will not because I'm not sure I will. And as your father, I want to keep my promise. Anything flabbergast you younger? People not so far removed from the family environment. Or perfect parents, which you could have had. Okay, already been mentioned? You good, Trent? Okay. Son, let me hear it. Okay. I think God certainly keeps his promises. God certainly empowers us to meet his expectations, but we know we won't always meet them. And then um, he's always consistent with his discipline. Yeah. So all three of those, I think, are just reflections of how God follows us. Okay. So let's recap. Obedience, respect, nurture, admonition, not provoking to wrath, expectation levels, and such, okay? Here are, if you Google this, top six reasons, you, top six ways you can frustrate your children. Number one, be always lecturing your children and never listening to them. So I, I dreaded my rides home, my ride home with my father after a football game when I was in junior high. We only won two games that year. After that, we never lost a game again, but which I was thankful. I would be lectured. And it was a half hour drive from my school to my house. And I would be lectured the whole way. I know we lost, Dad. I played. <laughs> so anyhow, lecturing. Okay, finding fault with them. 
Okay, we have a situation in one of our after school programs. We're, we're trying to figure out how best to deal with the guardian of a child who is constantly finding fault with that young person. Okay? Refuse to listen to them. Okay? My error sometimes in disciplining, not listening to my children. They would be trying to tell me what really happened, and I was thinking they were just giving me excuses to get out of their punishment. But come to find out, some of it was real. Okay? Demand too much from them. Permit too much. Okay? So from one extreme to the other, compare your children to other children. That is a no-no. Okay? It's not on here. Or just throw this in as a 50-cent addition. Even if you're not truly interested, so if you have more than one child, there's a good chance you're going to have more than one interest represented by those two children or more. And there's a good chance out of those two interests, you're really interested in one of those. And you're not so interested in the other one. Okay? I am not a fine arts kind of guy. Okay? I love cows, horses, pigs. You could put a nice painting on the wall of a horse. I'd be really happy. You get some fine art of Picasso or whoever, and I'm just going to go, yeah, nice. <laughs> um, many of our children were athletic, which was right up my alley, and one of them was more artsy, not up my alley. Okay? You can't let them know that you've got to act like what they're doing is the greatest thing that has ever come along just as much as the next one. Okay? You can't let them know you're not interested because then they're, it just doesn't work out right. Okay? So that's how you can frustrate your children. I don't know. And, and who in here would say that's not true? We know it's true because we've lived it. All right, here's the number one parenting verse. When you search the scriptures, I don't, the, the other list, you could, your top 25, your top 50, your top 10 are all going to vary. Some of the more common ones are there. This one is always number one. So I'm going to ask you for the definition. Then I, I've already shared the one that Randy Smith shared with us in Israel, but I want you to share the one you typically have when you read this verse and it's typically preached, someone tell me what this verse is meant to say that you typically have understood it or it's been taught to you. It may be right. Laura Beth. Okay. Okay, yep. Yeah. Yes. And I would say a good chunk of independent fundamental Baptists would have agreed with that interpretation. If you want your child to turn out to be a Christian, you need to raise them a Christian in the biblical ways. And if you do that right... No one ever defines what right is, but if you do that right, your child will grow up and, bam, be a Christian. Okay? So we know that's wrong, but any other ways of interpreting that? Just looking at what, some thoughts. And we have time, but we're not going to linger too long because we've got to get into the other material. Okay, so the way that Bob Wolf is describing, the, very similar to the way that Randy Smith taught us in Israel about the uh, 
uh, bitter fruit, putting it on the baby's lips to get them to create that sucking motion so that they can latch on to mom and, and start feeding. It, you don't have to teach the baby this. It's a natural thing that they will do. Bob's word was each child is bent in a certain direction, or another word might be tendencies, okay? Your children usually come out having a tendency. It usually becomes uh, uh, evident at some point in time, probably before age 10 or somewhere around in there. Take that tendency, whether it be mathematics, the arts, language, mechanics, computers, whatever, and train them with that natural bent, okay? Question, should you, though they don't have this natural bent, should you force them to take some other things for a well-rounded childhood experience? How many in here were forced to do something? <laughs> the one up front, he was, he was at a twitch in his arm. He, he ran it up real fast. We're forced to do something you really didn't care about. Yes. Okay. Help, hurt, don't know. Help. Help. I mean, when I was a kid, I didn't want to work. I wanted to run around with my friends. Oh. We made us mow the lawn. And, I mean, nowadays, now, that if they don't, I'm thankful that you help train them to put the wood up. Okay. So the suggestion or illustration was you made us work. We didn't want to work. You made us work. That was good. We developed a work ethic. Anything else you were forced to do, he really didn't want to. Am I correct in saying that when you were in school, you had to take home ec in the box in about seventh or eighth grade? And you all took the shop with it in the class, and they gave us the old home ec that pretty much made us work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so shop and home mech in uh, middle school, 7th and 8th grade, forced to take. Um, our school, you had to take two years of a foreign language. And so, and actually, we, I, I chose Spanish and actually enjoyed it. Uh, our second year, the last semester, we had a Spanish-speaking nun. We had the whole time period, the second half of the second year of Spanish, was nothing but Spanish. Um, so familiar with some Spanish words. Um, there are other classes, and you hear this all the time with younger people, right? Why do I have to take math? I'm never going to use math again in my life. Why do we have to take English? I don't know why we... Why do I have to take social studies? Right? You hear it all the time. Okay. So there is... Train up this child... There are natural tendencies, natural bent. Question is, do you make your child do something he or she doesn't want, and how much do you make them do it? Okay? So we've covered some biblical principles here, right? Now we're going to get into this. Various parenting styles. Okay? And when we go through here, I am not thinking of any parent in our church listening on a podcast, watching us from home, not at all. Terry and I, my wife and I, we went through this list and we figured out who we were, all right? And I wonder what, what we think we were and ask our children what they think we were, uh, see if they're the same. I think they will be, we will be graded by our children one notch higher than maybe what we anticipated. We'll see. So either you are a tiger, okay, or a dolphin or a jellyfish. I don't like where they get these titles from, okay? It is secular, and it stems from this. They will tell you we have evolved from animals, and we just carry on these certain animalistic parenting styles, okay? Don't agree with that. So you can use parenting style A, B, C if you want, but this is how they do it. Tiger, dolphin, jellyfish. Let's start at the top. What is a tiger parenting style, all right? Tiger parenting refers to a strict, authoritative method of parenting that is meant to raise high-achieving children. 
This often means foregoing sleepovers, parties, and other leisurely activities to focus on their studies or other extracurriculars, like going to soccer, going to your French class, going to your violin or piano class, going to the art class. Okay? The phrase tiger parenting was first introduced by author and law professor Amy Chua in her book Battle Him of the Tiger Mom. This is what I'm saying at the beginning. These were all illustrations. I changed it to parenting because I didn't want to think moms were being picked on. But if you read these definitions, you're going to find they're going to be talking about moms, which could be a really big slap as if dads aren't around. Just thinking about that. There is no negotiating with this style. Okay? The concept of tiger parenting originates from the teachings of the 5th century philosopher Confucius. Confucian philosophy promotes hierarchical family structures, loyalty, strong work ethic, honesty, and commitment to education and academic achievement. This is something else. I, I didn't say anything until this slide. If you start reading several of these articles, and just because I put several hours into studying this doesn't mean by any means I'm author authoritative on this, you will find, you will sense there's some ethnicity stuff going on here. And you will find that it, it just seems to lean this way. Asian people feel like they have better raised their children along this way of higher achievers than other ethnicities. And which isn't surprising, do you know how long the average Chinese student goes to school per day? Usually 6 or 7 in the morning to 6 or 9 at night. All the time. So you, you, I'm just sharing this. You just, you, if you, as you keep reading and you keep looking at who's writing these articles, you start sensing there's a little sense of superiority with the tiger parents. Okay, but everybody understand. Here's a summary of a tiger parent: overly strict, high expectations, fear-based approach, lack of autonomy for the child. Success is defined by achievements. Are they breaking any biblical principles? And if they are, which ones? Not, not implying that they are. I'm just asking, do you think they're breaking any biblical principle? And if they are, they may not be saying, nope, they're not. And if they are, what one are they? Joshua. Maybe not provoke your children to the wrath. How might that come into play, Joshua? Okay, in what way? Can you begin resenting your parents? Yes. So, there's, in a certain sense, you're not letting your child grow up. Their whole day is planned. This is one of these books, one of these articles was written by a tiger mom who had two daughters. The second daughter at age 13 said, basically, I had enough. I'm not going to be your little, not slave girl, but I'm not going to be your possession and only be doing what you want me to do. So now, is she breaking one of the scriptures we looked at? The, the child. This 13-year-old said, mm. Done with this. Not honoring, not honoring your parents, okay? So even though mom was not listening to her, 
she should have been expected to listen to her mom and do what she was saying. Okay? And from that point, from 13 to 18, how do you think it's going to go? Not well. Not well. Okay? All right. Any, any other scriptures? Yep. Perfect. This is how the Bible teaches it. Nah. Eh. We've got provoking them to anger. Uh, we've got the, but they still should be obeying. Okay. And I'm saying, in it's been my experience that that's going to be a very tense environment. All right. Think of David and his son who slept with his sister, stepsister. David sent him away for two years and did not what? Didn't discipline him, didn't talk to him. Okay. This child did what he said. David said, get out of here. But didn't go end up well. Okay. So, this is a tiger parent. Okay. So, we probably know of them. Maybe you think you were raised by one of them. I don't know. But that's tiger parenting. So, next is jellyfish parenting. Jellyfish is the opposite of tiger because the jellyfish has no, no spine, no backbone. Okay? So here's a jellyfish parenting. You could be one if your approach to parenting is less about structure, routine, and rules, and more about going with the flow and following your child's lead. You may be a jellyfish parent. Okay? What's biblical in that? Okay, you're really loving. Okay. How about the most popular verse on parenting? You're training them up the way they're what? The way they're bent. You're listening. You're not signing them up for ballet, flute lessons, violin, French class, soccer games, painting, art, museum tours. You're saying you're reading your child and you're determining this is what they like. Okay? If your approach to parenting is more less about structure, now where might you see some flaws in just that definition? Child runs the home. Very possible, right? So let's just get into it for time's sake here. As the name suggests, jellyfish parents are all about flexibility with their kids, their schedules, and their wants and needs. Jellyfish parents may threaten timeouts or grounding, but they rarely follow through with said consequences. What's wrong with that? Spare the rod, spoil the child. Once your child figures out you're bluffing, you better just cash it in. Because once they know, there is no, look at our society. What happens in big cities where the criminals have figured out there is no punishment for this crime? What happens? Oh, they become such a ruly town. I mean, they just act so obedient in, because we're all good people, really, right? You know, as a rule, humans are just good people. So we don't need this law of breaking and entering and stealing because we're just really good people. Is that what happens in these towns? Not at all. They prove their own theories wrong. That's what happens in a family. Have you noticed mom and dad never back up what they say? Yeah, they never. So why are we listening? And they won't. Jellyfish parents may threaten timeouts ground, but they rarely follow through with their consequence. Instead, they tend to prefer a more communicative approach to deal with behavior or let it go entirely. Children raised by a jellyfish parent are given a significant amount of autonomy and less structure and routine. Okay? So some of that is worthy. A communicative approach, that's a good thing, right? 
Because the thing that provoked children to anger, there was two of them that had the same thing. What was it? They're not listening. Okay, so that's good in that approach. And had anybody heard tiger or jellyfish, jellyfish parenting before we started talking about this tonight? Joshua, what are you, is this coming back from it? I know you listen to Moody Radio, and that's where I heard it. At the same time. Yes. Let's go. Okay, good. You can read that, right? You're up close. Even those who have bad vision can see that, I hope. At its essence, parents lean into the idea, this is jellyfish, in reality, that children are overstimulated by running from activity to activity. That's a testimony of another uh, tiger mom who became a jellyfish. And they, she lived in New York City. Very busy place, right? She was running her kids everywhere all the time. And one day it hits her. What are, what are we doing? Do you kids even want to go to your ballet lessons? I'm just, all I do, I get up in the morning, run, run, run. You go to school, I go to work. You get out of school, I get out of work. Run, 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 run. We come home, we go to bed, we get up the next morning. Not a believer, so it's seven days a week. Run, 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 run. This, 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 this. Is that good? No. So are some kids overstimulated? This is the jellyfish's response to the tiger. Okay? The theory is that parents have dragged their children, child from lesson to activity to sport, not necessarily based on any burning passion for the, the piano or ballet or swimming, but largely to fulfill parental societal social pressures. Are parents under pressure in our society to do certain things? Yes. I was sharing with somebody something that I've learned from younger parents. If your child is three years old and not in pre-pre-kindergarten, buddy, you are a neglectful parent. I'm thinking, I didn't even think of school until I was seven. I, and I think we managed. But that, that societal pressure, buddy, is there. And you better be in soccer, your kid better be in soccer, Upward something or wrestling. And it's real. Okay? So there are a lot of pressures. And do you think parents are under the pressure to get their kids in these things? This is what they're talking about here. Uh, the child will not be able to succeed. They think that their child will not be able to succeed in our society unless they attend the art series, flute workshop, and weekend French class. That's true. The idea behind jellyfish parenting is that one listens to what their child wants to do and just does that. Now, that would be wrong. I would have been playing sports from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed. My mom and dad wouldn't have had, had, would not have had any trouble with me. I never would have come inside. But I also would be dumb Okay, unable to speak English, and I'm not saying I can speak it now. And after sports, which if you're good, you last four years in any profession, you would be in your mid-20s and capable of doing what? Nothing. Okay, so you want to listen. Sounds excellent until I sit with the idea of my 10-year-old telling me all they want to do is play Roblox, Roblox, I don't have, have any idea what that is. I've seen Pokemon cards, but I have no idea what that is. After school for the rest of the academic year. Okay? That's jellyfish parenting. Jellyfish parenting, they do listen to their children, listen to what your child wants to do, and just do that. There's too much autonomy, can be too much autonomy. Children are raised without concrete boundaries and guidelines. Children can learn not to complete tasks, struggle with boundaries, tolerate inconsistent daily routines. What's another thing? Consistency in parenting with discipline and other things. What does a child need as well 
for them to succeed as a, as a basic rule. A routine. Okay? They have routines. They get comfortable with that. Boundaries. I don't know why I always remember this study, but I remember it. Do young people need boundaries? Yes. So here's what they did. They took like 100 second graders, put them out in a playground with no fence. The playground was so many square feet. Let's just say 100 square feet. They utilized 20 square feet of the playground. How many square feet is it? It's 100. Then they put a fence up around it and calculated how much of the square footage of the fence of the uh, playground they use. They went from like 20 square feet or 25 to 75 square feet. So they had to ask the question. You would have thought once we put the fence up, you would have used less of the playground than when there was no fence. With no fence, we thought you'd be running everywhere, but you didn't. You huddled in the middle. Why did you do that? They felt safer to walk around further out because there was a what? There was boundaries. There was a fence. We knew we could go up here and we were safe. Okay? Kids always, my mom and dad always have these rules. Yeah, you actually profit from them. You feel safer with them than if mom and dad made this a free-for-all. All right? So, summary of a jellyfish parent. So, without getting turning the slide, drum roll please, what do you think a dolphin parent is? No. A little bit of both. Okay? A dolphin is flexible, but firm. Flexible, but firm. Okay? The dolphin parent is the balance of these two extremes and is authoritative in nature. Like the body of the dolphin, these parents are firm yet flexible. Dolphin parents have rules and expectations, but also value creativity and independence. Okay? As our children got old, we did not make them play summer league baseball, softball, or basketball. If they, the only rule was this. If you started it, Joshua, you what? You had to finish. Okay? We would get you involved, but you had to, be, you had to want it. Now, when we were younger, they had no say in their violin. They went to violin. Okay? Which helped them, we believe, but that was one thing where we were sticklers on. But other than that, the child could choose. Growing up, for me, the only thing I was made to do was work. I did not have to join any club. I did not have to play any sport. I did not have to go to any ballet. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't have to do a lot of different things. Okay? I chose, for whatever reason, in seventh grade to play a musical instrument. That lasted one year. And I think that was just simply peer pressure because... All my friends did it. None of us lasted more than one year. But we were not made. But there was strict rules, and there was anticipation of events. Okay? That was a dolphin parent. They are collaborative, using guiding role modeling to raise their kids. So what do you think? about the parenting styles. Do you see you in any of them? Terry and I were pretty quick on figuring out what we were.
Yeah, and you're exactly right. At certain levels, you have to grow with your children, okay? Right now, you're, just, you're not looking to reason with your children when they're under five. They have no reasoning abilities. You want them to listen, okay? When they're running towards the street and the car's coming and you yell, stop, you don't want them thinking, Aristotle said, oh, mm. you want them to do what? Stop. Okay? That's all you're after. And you bring them to church. They have no idea of what's going on here. They're probably not for several years. You just teach them about God and his, the concept. And you can't do it. You can't use his name like that. And, but, and then eventually as they grow, it becomes theirs. So you do change. You, you, it, I think you, you do. And, I, and my experience has been you do. And when they get to be 18 and 19, you're still their parent, right? But you're not, obey me. Okay? You, you, you're, the relationship starts to change. And they become more, not of a peer, but one that you interact with. More instruction and reception of instruction. More interaction going on as they get older. And it's more of a dialogue. Uh, infancy to five, it's purely one-way direction communication. You, we speak, you listen. Okay? Basically, with some listening coming back. But then it just matures over the years to where you get to be 25. It's complete dialogue. They're talking, you're talking. They're listening, you're listening. So it should be changing. Does better outcomes? You know, I looked at some of the studies. Some of the uh, tiger parents did have... Um, but I don't think it was statistically significant as far as getting into schools and yada, yada, yada. Um, but their perception is our children excel in the professional world because that's how we train them. Well, if that's your goal, to excel in the professional world, and they come and see you once every 25 years, um, okay, you won. But if your goal is to have a relationship with them, have them know there's something bigger than their job, you probably lost. Okay? I have seen the tiger parent extraordinaire among two friends in particular that I know of. It was strict, structured, we're going to make you professionals when we get done. And they succeeded. The whole family, top-not professionals. Come home to see mom and dad? Yeah, and they think about it. Because they lost that sense of love and nurturing from them. So you have to be careful. But I, 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 I didn't read enough to know that they have conclusive studies. Maybe, Joshua, I didn't listen to the whole interview. Did anyone say that one parenting statistically or scientifically turned out better kids than, better kids, worldly term, okay? Did, no. Okay. All right. So does this make sense? So now if you say, uh, see a Facebook posting or Instagram, I'm a, oh no, I can't believe I'm a tiger parent. You'll say, now here, here. <laughs> <laughs> tiger, dolphin, jellyfish. We good? That's the Reader's Digest version. And hopefully also spur us on. I'm also learning you need to pick a grandparenting style. I thought once I raise my own kids, I'm good, right? I'm learning. You're not done yet. You need to choose what kind of grandparent you're going to be. And so trying to figure that out yet. But the grandchildren are a lot more forgiving than your children can be at times. <laughs> no, we love our children and praise God for children turning, turning, children turning out in the professional world 
you may have that verse, train up a child in the way he should go. That may be true. Turning a child out to love the Lord Jesus Christ is purely the work of the grace of God in their life. Bar none, in my opinion. Because I've seen parents, excellent parents, children, maybe not love the Lord or love them like maybe they want. I've seen parents that had done a rotten job, kids growing up, loving the Lord with all their heart. Okay? What is that? That's God. So that's one thing. This is strictly in the secular, carnal way, but Christian parents do take these tendencies on. So you have to ask yourself, what is the goal of our children? And that's another thing we, every parent needs to do. They need to picture what they think their child's going to look like when they're 21 years old and start molding them towards that goal. All right, questions or comments? All right, any prayer requests? Okay, those of you joining us at home, thank you for being with us. We look forward to seeing you Sunday morning. Question that we're going to be answering, what does God know about you? What does God know? And so we'll be taking a look. John chapter 2. John chapter 2 this Sunday. Thank you for being with us. Make sure to pray when we are done. See you Sunday.